Welcome everyone. This is September 26, 2020. My name is Todd Cretion. I'm the chair of the Europe Subcommittee of the Democratic Socialists of America International Committee. And we're very happy today to bring uh, to you a panel of activists and experts from various countries in Europe talking about the terrible health and political crisis that has struck over the last six months. More than 170,000 people have died in Europe from COVID-19, and the economy has pitched into a crippling recession. Healthcare and political systems across the continent have been pushed to the breaking point, raising critical questions about the role of governments, trade unions, social movements, and political parties on both the left and the right. Today, we have a panel of experts and healthcare activists, as I said, uh, who are gonna talk to us about the depth of the crisis and the response from both left political parties, social movements, trade unions, and healthcare professionals. I'm gonna introduce each of them very briefly and then we'll open up, the, open up the discussion. First, we're very happy to have with us Petter Nielsen. He's a member of the Center for Marxist Social Studies and works for the left party in Stockholm. Ornella Punza is a medical doctor specialized in internal medicine in Rome. She has practiced in Italy, Malawi, and the United Kingdom, and currently works in the National Institute of Health in the Communicable Diseases Department, where she has been involved in COVID-19 surveillance. Jorge Luis Diaz Gonzalez is medicine and public health uh, in, is in medicine and public health in Barcelona, at the Mar de Barcelona Hospital. He is the communication officer for the Association of Preventative Medicine and Public Health Resident Physicians and a member of Anticapitalistas. And last but not least, Lara McNeil is a physician at Eastbourne District General Hospital and the Young Labor Representative on the Labor Party's National Executive Committee. I hope I've gotten all those details right. If I've missed anything, please correct me. What we're gonna be doing this afternoon is having a round of presentations from our panelists then we'll be doing uh, some guided questions and back and forth uh, between myself and the panelists. And also I think the panelists may ask each other some questions or respond to their remarks. We'll do a couple rounds of that. And then uh, if there are questions that come in, you can put them on the Facebook comments and we'll try to get to some of those questions. Uh, but we're gonna mostly focus on, on what this panel of uh, folks is gonna share with us today. So feel free to put up your questions and we'll try to get to those if we have time. The whole event is gonna be about 90 minutes. We're gonna keep it short and sweet. Uh, and just one note of business. If you are a DSA member and you are interested in volunteering or being a member of the International Committee, you will see a newsletter that was just sent out by DSA's National Political Committee, I believe Thursday or Friday, September 24th. And in that, there is a link to apply to be a member of one of the subcommittees uh, for, this is the Europe subcommittee, there's, um, there's Middle East and Africa, there's the Americas, there's Asia, there's multiple uh, working groups. And if you'd like to, or, or subcommittees, if you'd like to be on one of those, please fill out that uh, application and send it in to the, to the uh, link that's mentioned in the National Political Committee uh, DSA newsletter. So with that, I'd like to open it up and we're gonna throw it over to Peter Nielsen for uh, 10 minutes or so. Take it away, Peter. Thanks. Uh, thanks to Todd and Chris for giving me the opportunity to speak. Uh, first off, I'd like to apologize. English isn't my first language and uh, a lot of the words that I'll be using weren't in much use in Swedish uh, six months back. And epidemiologist is a hard word in any language. Uh, but that being said, I'll try to contrast what I, what I believe sets Sweden apart in an international comparison. And that being said, I don't, I, I hope it, it will not be sort of a nationalist competition about, you know, winning and losing strategies. Uh, and I think also we're in, we're still in the midst of, of the development. It's, and it will, it will be perhaps 10, 15 years before we have the, the full, uh, um, sum of uh, the results of the actions that have been taken. So, uh, I'll try to briefly summarize the, the points here. The healthcare system in Sweden, was in, in, you know comparatively strong. It's it's in a worse uh, state than it has been in Sweden for a long time. The, the last 20 or 30 years has been a, um, seeing successive cutbacks in the welfare sector in general. But then again, compared to other countries, there is there is still a, a large quota of, of healthcare per person. So in terms of specific medical care, there was never actually. Uh, 
there was never actually a, a threat of the, them being uh, uh, short. Uh, some of the intensive care units that were billed as an emergency measures were never put to use. Uh, and, and in general, the strategy of, of sort of flattening the curve uh, maintained a safe distance to the, to the need for intensive care or medical care. But uh, in, in the healthcare system taken more broadly, the, the big catastrophe in Sweden was the, the situation in elderly care units and specifically in the first months of the pandemic. At the moment, there is around 6,000 people that have died from, from uh, COVID-19 in Sweden. And uh, a, a large majority of those, almost all of them were uh, people above uh, 75, 80 years uh, living in elderly care units. Um, and it has to do with the specific structure of elderly care in Sweden, uh, where you're only admitted to elderly care when you're uh, really sick. So you stay at home for uh, the, the longest possible time. And then uh, at the end of your life, you're admitted to elderly care. And once the, the pandemic reached these units, uh, it was a really, really bad situation that um, accounts for almost all of the death toll in the beginning months that made Sweden sort of the worst case uh, for a while. Uh, at the moment, the, the, um, the R number or the rate of infection is, is quite low in Sweden. It's a, a f maybe 200 to 300 people uh, infected every day, but the death rate is single digits at the moment. It seems that there are tendencies for uh, a recurring growth now in the fall when people return to work, but those are still tendencies and there, is no, there are no figures to, to the exact you know, the development. There's talk of, of new restrictions uh, to counter this uh, recent development. And the Swedish strategy in, in, in general terms is one of, it's a mix of recommendations, regulations, and a very few actual legislations. And this has to do with the, the tradition of, of government in Sweden and the specifically the, the principle of subsidiarity that says that the most proximal or the nearest authority to any situation is the one to, to uh, make the decisions on how to counter it. So in Sweden, that's a public health authority. Um, and that means that the actual strategy, the, the restrictions and so forth aren't necessarily seen even as a political issue in Sweden. They're most, mostly seen as a technical issue that has had almost consensus backing from the political parties. Um, and the discussions have mainly been about, you know, uh, unemployment benefits, uh, labor contracts and so forth. Uh, but the actual restrictions are, are mostly in the form of recommendations. So people have been advised to stay home, work from home if possible, to avoid commuter traffic, to not travel too much and so forth. But there has been no, uh, you know, no legislation, no actual banning. Uh, and this is still, it, it has led to at the beginning a 30% uh, decrease in commuter traffic, for example, just by uh, um, recommendations from the public health authority. And this has to do as well with, with maybe the, the concept from Michel Foucault about governmentality and how the, the, there's a strong sense of trust and obedience towards state or uh, public authority recommendations in Sweden. So uh, there, even just an advisory text or something has a strong, uh, will, will be followed by, by a majority of the Swedish population. Um, so in terms of what, what, what this meant for the political parties, as I said, it, there wasn't a, a necessarily a political debate amongst the parties about the strategies or the tactical decisions. In the beginning of the pandemic, the uh, governing Social Democratic Party uh, saw a boost in, in their numbers, which all, almost, I mean, I, I think it's common for all our countries, but in times, of cri in, in times of crisis, if there's a strong governing party, they will see an increase because people feel that they are handling it well in, in, uh, until proven otherwise. Maybe not in the United States, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, but, uh, and they, so they gained uh, almost 10% in the polls. Uh, and that was mainly, I would guess, taken from the right populist Sweden Democrats, our anti-immigration party, because for a while the question of immigration was off the public debate. Uh, and everyone was only talking about the pandemic. Now, sadly, we have a restart of sort of the general 
public debates and now it's mostly about immigration and crime again and concurrently the social democrats are are losing ground and the sweden democrats are are coming back so um, i'm not sure if there's too much to say about the, the political situation there are in, in sweden we have a, a weak minority government the social democrats and the greens are supported by the liberals and the old farmers party with passive support from the left um, and they 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 are not able to do much so for every sort of progressive labor market reform for example um, subsidies now with with the pandemic for unemployment benefits they also have to do or have to do but to to buy the support of the liberals they have they have um, pushed forward for um, tax cuts for for high income uh, wage earners and uh, subsidies for uh, having you know private uh, cleaning services in your home and you know just stupid liberal stuff um so and also i i would say that um from other social movements in sweden there has there had have, have been critiques um there was a debate within sort of the profession of epidemiology about the more nitty-gritty details of, of wearing face masks or you know technical issues such as those but it hasn't really had a impact on the on the general debate there is um, i mean there is sort of an ultra leftist critique and i don't mean that in the sense of them being radical but more in sort of the leninist sense that they it is a critique that's not tied to the political conjuncture they say that you know we would we should have paid uh, paid free leave for for the working class without being able to actually point to any political subject that would be able to carry that demand or push it through but there are sort of that type of of demands being raised um, in terms of the res the relation to the european union sweden is one of the fru frugal four uh, this term being tossed around in the european union it's sweden denmark austria and one other country ne the netherlands i think that were against the the big uh, budget package yeah the big bu budget package from from the european union and wanted it to, to be um converted into loans uh, rather than subsidies um, and even the left party um, was was uh, promoting this line in sweden i think it has to do with a, a sense of distrust for the economic policies of the european union more than in you know, sort of a question of international solidarity at least, at least with regards to the left um, i'm sure they would like to I, I sincerely hope they would like to to uh, share the burden but they don't uh, have a lot of faith in the european union being a good vehicle for doing this so i'll stop there and you'll tell me if i missed anything important this round thanks thank you peter uh, very informative and your english is perfect so no worries about that. Uh, next, we're going to go to Ornella Punzo. Okay, I was able to reactivate my microphone. Um, hi, everybody. So I have to apologize as well because uh, English is not my first language and I have not been practicing English since I'm in Italy since a long time now. Um, my point of view is um, a, a lot on health, on the health perspective, because it is my job. I'm a physician and I work in epidemiology. Um, Italy was the first um, country with local transmission of uh, COVID-19. And that is the starting point of all the discussion about Italy and every type of uh, comparison with other countries and what happened uh, afterwards. Um, there are certainly a lot of uh, critical points regarding the fact that um, it wasn't uh, evident from the beginning that we had local circulation of the virus. And uh, we discovered that after probably a couple of months, month and a half, that um, the virus was already uh, going around uh, in the Lombardy region. And uh, finally, uh, now we have um, a cumulative number of deaths uh, of 35,800, um, with uh, 
305,000 uh, cases. Uh, the average age um, went down uh, during the months. Uh, of course, the mostly hit people population um, uh, regarding the deaths have been uh, elderly. Uh, and, uh, but we can say that the cases now uh, have an average age of approximately 40 years of age. And that um, is related to the fact that we started um, um, testing and practicing all the swaps on people returning from holidays and people uh, having been abroad in certain countries or in certain regions in Italy during the summer. So we have a lot now of younger cases and, uh, and also children and adolescents involved in the, in the cases. Um, so how my country's uh, health system responded, um, this is also a similar picture uh, and worse for certain aspects than other countries in Europe, with the, all the austerity cuts in the last 10, approximately 10 years, um, we, have, um, we have had linear cuts to every single service in the national health system. So, uh, of course, all the preventative aspects of health are the worst um, and the worst hit because uh, all the aspects that are not immediate care, emergency care, something that is tangible and it's something that has an immediate return into the population perception uh, are um, evidently uh, the ones that are uh, sacrificed uh, more easily during the years. So uh, this is um, something that um, is related to uh, vaccination services, but also to all the preparedness aspects, uh, which are uh, fundamental in managing a pandemic like this one. So um, the numbers is that we, uh, we have now uh, only 6.5% of the GDP invested into um, health, and this is lower than uh, Germany, France, and the UK. And um, this is why we had uh, huge problems in managing this pandemic at the beginning, also related to the fact that it started when we didn't know it, it already started. So the circulation of the virus was really strong in Lombardy and the most hit um, re, um, um, cities, Bergamo and Brescia, uh, were uh, experiencing a lot of deaths so I don't know if uh, other people around here in Europe uh, saw images of um, um, the military service uh, getting the bodies from these cities to other cities because there was no space to, um, to, to uh, put them together uh, after they died in hospital or at home. And a lot of people died at home. A lot of people died without uh, proper care, uh, even we, if we don't have still now uh, an appropriate treatment, but at least uh, we know we can give uh, dexamethasone, so corticosteroids, we know that we can give oxygen, uh, and that people don't realize that their oxygen is so low, so they have to be treated very promptly. So all these things that we started to understand very early on uh, were impossible, because there weren't um, th there wasn't a primary health care that was strong enough. So there is um, a need for rethinking the health system, not only investing and investing also without any return, and this is the paradigm of any discussion on this, and also to invest um, in, in health care that is not only hospital-centered. There was a piece, um, maybe I can go over that afterwards, uh, an, a paper published on um, the catalyst on the New England Journal of Medicine uh, by some doctors in Bergamo. Uh, and they were talking about uh, the need of shifting from patient and illness-centered care to community-centered care. And this is a very old uh, discussion. Uh, it's not anything new. Uh, we know from Alma Ata in 1978 that uh, um, 
primary health care is the um, basis of any strong health system. And this is true in richer countries and in Europe, but it's also true in lower and middle income, and, and middle income countries. So um, it, is, it has been a problem of accessibility, continuity, uh, flexibility of the service, because when everything goes into the uh, hospital and there is no way of being treated elsewhere, there is a problem in a pandemic, evidently. So um, shifting to the, uh, so there is an aspect that is also, I mean, it's too long, too many things to mention in this uh, uh, tragedy really that uh, hit my country. Um, but of course, like in other countries, uh, the pandemic um, disclo disclosed all the problems of uh, inequalities in the treatment and uh, inequalities in accessing care. That even if we have uh, supposedly a universal system and uh, it's mostly free at the point of care, at the point of care, but, uh, mm, we pay a little bit. We, we have co-payments for some treatments, but emergency is free and in uh, urgent treatment is free um, and it's tax uh, based. Um, but we have a lot to rethink about social determinants of health and how health should be accessible for all, also minority, also people without a job, also people working um, with um, uh, irregularly, which is quite common in my country, and for which the subsidies that have been started uh, weren't actually uh, there because they don't exist for, for the work, for the labor market. Um, so I have, um, I, I'm going quickly for the political uh, scene. The government was very strong in imposing the lockdown and we have um, evidence that that was a good choice in Italy because we had a very strong circulation of the virus and we had, especially in Lombardy, a very high density of population. So it was impossible to stop the circulation and make it and make the curve go down uh, like we saw in many graphs about the, this pandemic, uh, without any strong intervention. Um, the majority of the population uh, believes that this choice was the right one, although it cost a lot in terms of economy, in terms of personal lives, in terms of stress, in terms of mental health, uh, anywhere. And it, the lockdown here uh, lasts two months, uh, from approximately the of March to the of May, and then the reopening was quite gradual, which actually I think was a very good choice because um, that, that we don't know yet, but might be the reason why we didn't see a strong, a steep increase of cases after, uh, after the summer, although we are having now the reopening of the schools. So we have to see how it goes. Um, of course, we had all the uh, negationists and all the, the uh, since the government here is uh, PD, so post-communist, uh, uh, let's say, uh, left, the, the main left party, which is now center left, uh, and uh, together with the populist five stars, and they are governing together, and uh, they actually made quite an impression with some strong choices, not only about the lockdown, but also the subsidies, also uh, having this kind of Marshall plan to, uh, for the recovery after the pandemic and all that. The right uh, was trying to uh, counteract this uh, strength with some no masks uh, kind of uh, attitudes of behaviors or saying that we've been um, that uh, our freedom is not there anymore because we have been forced to the lockdown and then to the masks and then all to, to this. But um, of course, they have some strength in the fact that people um, became poorer, they lost their jobs. So although the subsidies were there, uh, it is still very difficult to cope with. So uh, it, I mean, a lot of people, I, I believe, are prone to believe that the right would be better just because they promised that they would get more money or cut taxes. Um, 
uh, that's it, I think, because I, I'm, uh, I'm <laughs> finishing my time. Uh, maybe afterwards I can say something more about um, the aspects of the social um, civil society and how to protect the minorities and immigrants and, uh, and the relation with the EU in response. Thank you very much, Ornella. Um, well said. Uh, it was very clear and very important information. So thank you for that. Uh, next, we're going to Jorge Luis Diaz Gonzalez from Barcelona. Uh, hello. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks the DSA for the for the invitation, and I think it's a very good idea to do this this kind of debates uh, to you know to put in common the the impressions in different European countries, and especially to, to talk with the, with the US uh, country also. And uh, I'm gonna follow the same scheme, you know, first talking about the healthcare system, then talking about the policies that our government made, then explain a little bit how the socialist movements have reacted, and then talk a little bit about Europe. So first of all, um, uh, the, the thing that we have to understand is that Spain has suffered a lot in this crisis. We are one of the countries with the uh, uh, public health figures uh, worse. We have more than 700,000 uh, infected, more than 30,000 deaths, 20,000 of them in nursing homes. But we also are suffering a lot from an economic point of view. Our gross domestic product has fallen more than 18%. And uh, we have a, a huge crisis of unemployment. So uh, topics related with it, I mean, it's very complicated to compare countries, you know. But I think, uh, as my colleagues also commented, we have to uh, talk about the, the so-called lost decade, uh, the austerity decades, the austerity policies. And I think Spain is also one of the countries in Europe that suffered that the most. And uh, in this crisis, uh, it's a very, very important topic because uh, the areas of uh, the Spanish uh, healthcare system that uh, were uh, more cutted or more privatized or more, um, you know, suffered more from austerity were uh, primary care and public health services. So when these were literally the, the ones that uh, should be stronger during the pandemic, and they also uh, uh, were not prepared, were very weakened uh, right before the, the pandemic came. And another topic uh, related with this, I think it's, it has to do with uh, how we reacted to the pandemic in Italy, because we were the second country in time to suffer the consequences of the virus. And we, we didn't really learn from what was going on in the north of Italy or the, what was going on in their healthcare system. And so to understand the, the political response, we have to understand that the, we had a general election in uh, November 2019, where Unidas Podemos, the, we can call it the most socialist uh, party in Spain, and uh, PSOE, which is a socio-liberal, socio-democrat, uh, historic party, uh, made a coalition agreement. This has been called the most progressive government in Spain history and also the most progressive government in Europe. But I think with this, uh, with its response to the COVID crisis, uh, this uh, affirmation is far from reality. Although we had a very, very hard lockdown, uh, three months of uh, almost complete lockdown, this late response that I was talking before was uh, related with a, with a first intention of our government of uh, putting the economic interest forward the public health interest. We had a, a week or two that uh, the non-essential works were being opened, although they had uh, many cases in the workplaces. We have seen uh, that uh, redistributive policies uh, lack in, the, in our response. So the, uh, the only um, redistributive policy is uh, called the Ingreso Minimo Vital, which is like a crisis basic income. Uh, they sold it like it was a revolution, you know, that, that with, this was uh, uh, something that would uh, save lives and save the economy at the same time. 
and it didn't work because the, we have an administrative chaos. So 600,000 people asked for this uh, ingreso minimo vital and only 6,000 uh, got accepted. So it's only 1% of the people who ask for, for this uh, basic income actually got it accepted and very few cases actually got the money yet. So this, uh, this is uh, one thing that we have to, to understand. Also, uh, uh, one of the main reasons why the government hasn't done uh, a lot of uh, you know, yeah, redistributive uh, policies is because uh, Unidas Podemos is uh, in a very weak uh, situation within the government. So the, the socio-democrats or the socio-liberal PSOE, which uh, was the party that um, leaded the response to the 2008 economical crisis, so meaning the, the party that uh, followed all the austerity policies coming from Europe, it's also leading the response now and uh, they haven't changed uh, their ideology so they are doing basically their, the same responses. Uh, the economic leader of the, of the Socialist Party is the, bueno, the PSOE party is uh, Nadia Calviño which was a candidate for uh, president the Europe Parliament recently so you maybe know about her, but she has a very conservative uh, profile. And uh, if you understand who she is and who, what power she has, you understand that this government is not going to uh, work a lot for working class. The only good thing that the, this government has is that the, the right wing is very divided now in Spain. We have uh, three main political parties in the right. Uh, being uh, Partido Popular, uh, the traditional conservative one, and uh, the liberal Ciudadanos and the extreme right wing uh, box as the, the main uh, right now opposition to the government. So this divide with, from the right explains why uh, the government is not suffering a lot because uh, the right is fi fighting each other. You know? Uh, so, uh, talking about social movement response, this is a, when I, when I was uh, preparing for this, I realized that uh, there is not much talk about social movements in Spain right now, because uh, we are in a, in a time of inactivity. And I think this is because of uh, COVID pan what COVID pandemic uh, has done to social movements, because uh, we have uh, had a lot of months of limiting the right to, for assembly. So this is uh, it has hard uh, pretty much or has wounded a lot uh, social movements. The social movements, especially feminism and ec ecological movements, were really were really strong in Spain last year. Uh, we saw a lot of young new activists going to these movements, and they were really uh, putting a lot of topics into the political agenda. But now, uh, since COVID, this has uh, gone uh, really bad, I think. And uh, also, uh, we can explain this because some parts of these movements are also now in the government. So there is a, an activity related with that also. And Europe, when we talk about Europe, you know, it's, it's very hard for, uh, for the people in Spain to think that the, the Europe will be the solution because we, uh, we have uh, very recent response uh, in the 2008 economic crisis and we suffered a lot from austerity but uh, still uh, our government celebrated a lot the, rec the reconstruction uh, fund agreement which we agree is a lot of money but uh, the, the EU also failed to, to do solidarity in the past and also failed to do solidarity in the present because uh, during COVID pandemic Countries like Spain and Italy needed help, needed equipment, uh, and we had to uh, go to countries like China for to ask for this help. We we, we didn't have any help from the, the European Union uh, organizations. Uh, so I think that in Europe there is a crisis of governance, uh, a crisis of uh, human rights. When we speak about the refugees in in Greece. And I think uh, uh, this uh, has to, to be in the mindset of everyone when we talk about uh, how Europe will respond to, to the COVID crisis. And I think I, I will end it up uh, here. Uh, 
in order for us to have more time for the, the answers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jorge. That was uh, very informative as well. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, so our last uh, presentation is going to be given by Lara McNeil, uh, who's in Hull in England now. And um, after she speaks, then we're going to have a round of uh, discussion and responses. So take it away, Lara. Thanks so much. And thanks for DSA for inviting me. Um, please, other speakers, do not apologize for your English. I'm very embarrassed that English is my only language. So I apologize if I speak too quickly. Um, but I'm just going to talk a little bit about the situation in the UK um, and the political context in which our health system was not prepared for COVID and how the left responded. Um, we had no excuse with COVID really, we knew it was coming and we had a little bit of delay after places like Italy to see how bad it was going to get in our country. Um, and obviously our Conservative government dealt with it um, extremely badly. Um, the crisis has shown that there's underlying holes in our health and social care system. We don't have enough staff in our health service. We don't have enough tests still, and we don't have safe working conditions for um, our staff in the NHS and the social care sector. Um, the Tory government has underfunded, privatised and fragmented our health service and um, the staff in it have taken the hit. And our system was very unprepared when this pandemic started and it still is now however many months on. The Tories set this wartime narrative with NHS staff being heroes, even though we saw people dying. Right, and it, it set the scene purpose loss of life, which we knew actually could have been prevented if our healthcare system was more prepared and decisions had been taken earlier. And right now, I think we're seeing we might have a second wave, and we're also seeing a backlog of a lot of non coronavirus clinical need um, and problems in social care, and those will impact people's lives. Um, you know, people with cancer and other conditions very significantly. The political context of our healthcare system, the NHS um, is an example of what a Labour left government can do right when they put something in which is hard for future governments to take away, not just simply funding more, as Ornella was saying, but uh, renationalising and reorganising and focusing more towards preventive medicine. Right now, if we just focus on pouring more money into the NHS, that will just be siphoned off as profit. So we do need to think about renationalising the health service. Um, rather than just funding it more. And that's what a Labour government and a Labour manifesto should commit to now. In the wider political debate, we're often far too com complacent as the left that the NHS is the top of the political agenda. British people love the NHS. Um, and we think that, oh, that will just prevent outwardly anti-NHS political movement succeeding, but that's not what happens. And we actually have to fight for it as the left because the Tories have an underhand way of claiming to be for the NHS and public health care because it is so popular in our country, which shows that the success of previous Labour governments. However, they're privatising it through the back door. They're outsourcing, for example, radiology reporting, cleaners, porters on low wages, private finance initiatives to build hospitals, um, a privatised social care system and the pharmaceutical industry, for example, recently. Essential Pharma are stopping supplying a cheaper brand of lithium, which is a life-saving drug for people with bipolar and other mental health conditions, forcing the NHS to buy a more expensive version. You think that this would be a story of something that happens in the US, but it's happening with a national, nationalized healthcare system um, because the things around it are still being run for profit. Short of the public being charged for healthcare directly, uh, you know, we still have a, a national health service, which is being uh, dismantled and we can't be complacent as, as the left to this. And in response to this, it challenges the Labour Party and opposition to up our game. Previously, we've held blame for this. It's a longer battle than just this crisis. We lost the original values of the NHS in the last um, you know, few Labour governments. Um, of course, the Tories handle the NHS worse when they have it in their hands. But a cross-party consensus developed under new Labour, which when they supported private finance initiatives that allowed the process of privatization and reorganization to occur at alarming rates without oppositions in the year after. And as a Tory minister previously said, King Clark, it would have led the public to the streets if a Tory government had done what a Labour government did. We hear a lot about not politicizing this crisis, which obviously just falls into the hands of liberal solutions, which are paper thin and a love for the NHS in our country without a political understanding of how it's under attack is a very dangerous place for the British public to be. So that's the, the context of the NHS and how have the left responded? Um, it hasn't been good enough from the Labour Party's point of view, to be quite frank. 
In terms of social movements, we've seen a mobilization of the, the Black Lives Matter movement in the streets, even during the pandemic, socially distanced protests, and we've seen youth movements come out and be predicted grade system which disadvantaged people from working class backgrounds and young people came to the streets and the government you turned on that and made sure that people's grades were higher and that was a massive win for for some of these social movements in absence of a organized you know political structure the trade unions at you know at the top level um the trade union congress in the uk negotiated furlough schemes workers being paid they sent their wages um despite not having to work which was amazing but on the ground the movement is definitely demoralized we're at low levels of trade unionism especially in young people who are working in insecure jobs and ultimately hospital staff face things like not getting their leave massive understaffing in icu departments and it's not really a situation where you can strike when you're dealing with a pandemic. So it's very, very, very difficult to oppose this on, on a level with such a demoralized and low unionized workforce. So it's been really difficult to be honest with you. Um, and the situation in the Labour Party is obviously in the context of Keir Starmer being elected as the leader, which is a change from Jeremy Corbyn. And obviously you have to take into account, um, which is a, a whole nother talk in itself about how that actually managed to happen um and you know this is a situation that we're in now our shadow health secretary has definitely been great on this and has questioned the speed of lifting the lockdown measures and um, contact tracing being not fully operational and all nhs staff not being routinely tested and we can remain hopeful that our leader starmer is not a blairite and has a more commitment to social democracy than some other historic figures in the labor party but it's starting to become a bit clear that we're not offering alternatives or solutions to the crisis Keir Starmer in his election campaign said that my socialism is rooted in a burning desire to stand up for the powerless against the powerful, but it's becoming clear that they're just offering competence and competence against the government's clear incompetence is not a strategy in itself, it's not policy. They're focusing more on the new leadership slogan in the latest part of political broadcast to show distance from the last leadership, which is essentially an internal battle which is a complete misplaced priorities when we've got this pandemic going on. And on the main issues where the government's going wrong, we haven't been strong enough, whether that's on testing, like our NHS app, um, the testing being outsourced to private companies like Serco. They did a whole PR drive about starting a new hospital with ventilators, and then it basically got shut down because you know, they didn't even think or realize that patients might need renal dialysis or other things that I couldn't offer. And then they realized there was not enough staff to staff an ITU because the staffing levels in the National Health Service were so low. Um, and basically, and we also supported the move by the government to send kids back to school, which is arguably one of the ways that coronavirus is going to spread the most, which was against the union movement of the, the teaching unions who stood strong and said they didn't want kids to come back to school. And, and that was a, a big turning moment showing how the Labour Party was not was not in tune with the concerns of the public or um, the unions and, and teachers and people who are working on the front line who they claim to support and say were heroes like the government. We have identified some of the problems a long time after it's happened and have been accused of hindsight analysis, which I think has a little bit of accuracy. And the left of the party are always accused of not wanting to get into power, being the loony left with no grip on reality. But the reality is we are in opposition and we have to set out an alternative. If we can't be seen to be an alternative government, then appearances of competence will simply fall apart. We're currently actually doing quite well in the polls, but we know these fluctuate. And if we continue to pursue a focus group, pollster led expert an analysis of politics, then this apolitical lens will simply lead to confusion about our morals and it's frankly not good enough in such an unprecedented crisis when the Tories are actually pursuing some radical policies in terms of um, the income they gave people for not working. They would seem to be to the left of us in in some things, even though we know that just, you know, handing out money is not the same as giving wealth and power to working people over the long term and um, it very much embarrassed the Labour Party. And when voters are crying out for answers and solutions um, and the 2019 election showed that voters will take a risk, um, it's not good enough. And the Tory government is destroying um, the welfare state and we can't be complicit in this as the Labour Party. 
all of this is is part of this incoming narrative that the NHS isn't working. You've actually seen some of the most right wing papers come out and agree with that and and basically be in the same place as Labour saying this is not working. But we know they have very different um, solutions. So they would privatise the NHS and say the NHS isn't working. A nationalised health system can never work. Give it to the give it to the private sector. And unless Labour is strong enough on that second part, so the NHS isn't working but this is the solution, then a consensus will grow around the NHS not working and then the right wing will win the argument on the private sector has to run it. And that is something that we're actually, we're facing quite imminently. And that's why the left has to be so strong and not just be complacent in the, in the British love of the NHS in this crisis. We've seen in the first bit of the pandemic, people coming out and clapping for the NHS every Thursday, which was frankly quite lovely. Um, but while real wages for those NHS workers were falling, it was pretty superficial. And the left has to go beyond that. And rather than just support those measures, actually lay out policies of how they're going to support these heroes in this crisis. So I'll, I'll just finish on this. Uh, there's no remedy for this crisis, the public health crisis, the economic crisis, or any crisis of capitalism without a clear alternative socialist plan. One does that does not simply treat the symptoms of the crisis, but the cause, which is stark inequality in wealth and power. And even when our communities are dying, young and old, it still seeks to make profit. And this is a perfect time for international socialist movements to come together and clarify these demands um, to make Thank you very much, Lara. Um, thanks to all of our panelists. Those were very intriguing and informative presentations. Really appreciate it. And I know that they'll go a long way towards helping DSA members in the United States become better equated and better educated uh, in terms of the depth of the crisis in Europe, but also the political responses. Um, I'm going to throw a question to, to all of you. Um, and this may be um, uh, a very uh, a question which comes from living in the United States right now. Um, and in the United States, there is a sense of escalating crisis, um, of, of social disaster. Um, and some of this is tied up with Trump, and um, that is an obvious uh, uh, amplification of, of the crisis. But it's not just Trump. The, the police killings, the crisis in our healthcare system, um, the environmental crisis, uh, the crisis of, of uh, opportunities for youth, um, uh, the Me Too movement exposing sexual assault. There's been, there's a sense in the United States that something is fundamentally broken and going sharply in the wrong direction. Um, and one of the key dividing points in the United States has been uh, kind of us and them. And the us and them that the right wants to pitch is, is uh, people from the United States versus immigrants. And I know in Europe in the last few years that immigration has been a very critical issue, both within Europe uh, and from outside into Europe. And I wanted to ask if, kind of a related question, is that sense of crisis, it, it almost seems like li listening to you all, it almost feels like the governments were fast or slow, but they did respond. People essentially tried to do the right thing. And there's a, even though there's a worry about a second wave, there's almost a sense of like, you can see how the thing could be contained. Whereas in the United States, it's just no one knows what's happening. Um, and the most dangerous thing is the scapegoating. So in Europe, the, the, despite the differences in the governments, is there a sense that the us and them, that the us has expanded, that in Britain and Sweden and, and the Spanish state and Italy, has the anti-immigrant sentiment and the, the othering of scapegoats diminished? Has the general population said we're all in this together? And even though the right wing is going to attack, that in general, the people have said we're all in this together. We need national health care. We need social responses and not scapegoating. Um, and, and is that the general sense in your experience in Europe? It, or is it complicated? Uh, is it both the left and the right? Um, just to give us some sense, if you could, about how the question of the other, the question of immigration, the question of scapegoating, how that is, how that has uh, been developed throughout the course of this crisis. And uh, maybe we'll just, if, every, if everybody could take uh, two or three minutes just to respond to that, um, 
and then we'll have some time for uh, other things that you wanted to say. So maybe we'll just go backwards in this order. So uh, Lara, if you want to start. Yeah, so I think it's always been an issue, um, obviously, the immigration debate and scapegoating, especially in the UK around the Brexit debate, debate obviously, which has been dragged out since the uh, 2016 referendum onwards. And actually, you know, my opinion is because the left weren't present in that Brexit debate, when Brexit won, it was a triumph for the racists who led that Leave campaign. So that has definitely made uh, things like racism, scapegoating and um, anti-immigration debates very, very rife in the UK. In, in, in regards to COVID, there definitely has been a lot of that. There's been a lot of scapegoating the public in general. And like the government said, you know, go out to restaurants, we'll discount your money so you can like help the economy grow. And then now they're saying, oh, it's, it's the public's fault because you're not following measures whilst communicating things extremely randomly at night on Twitter, etc. So there's a lot of scapegoating. Whether it's scapegoating towards, um, you know, an and other and immigrants and things like that, there definitely has been a degree of that. There were some lockdowns, um, introduced during Eid and the kind of the the narrative underneath that all was you know people meeting up for Eid is like spreading coronavirus and all this kind of stuff there's definitely a government a right-wing government that's clearly failing and looking for any opportunity to scapegoat and you have to be really um against that obviously as a left and been again with the Labour Party, um, you know, on some of the questions about refugees and some of the refugee crisis stuff that's come out recently um, over the summer. We haven't been strong enough on that as well. Um, it, it's definitely a big issue. And I think any right wing government will try and blame um, people when they're making mistakes during this crisis. And we've got to come together. And that, that's why liberal, you know, centrist solutions and parties will never be enough, is it? Because there is an us and them. There is an us and them. It's not everyone work together and be nice and progressive we have to define who the us and them are because otherwise the right will do it for us um, and that's the duty of the left to make sure we stand against that and actually show who is um you know the cause of of these problems which is the elites the billionaires the capitalist class uh, thanks lara uh jorge well i think it's a it's a very good question because i think it's a very geog geographically related i mean in spain there is definitely a sense of crisis because uh, we are now the leading country in the second wave, uh, Madrid being the epicenter of it. And I think the feeling that this is over is uh, far from, uh, from the reality right now. There is a lot of uncertainty and there is, a, uh, I would say, a fight uh, uh, for looking someone to blame. And when we talk about uh, scapegoating, there is a there is a there have been a, uh, we have seen a lot of scapegoating uh, going on in the in the political agenda, especially because uh, the third uh, political party in Spain is Vox, which is a stream right, and has become the leaders of the opposition because the the Popular Party is in a in a weak moment right now. Um, Vox basically. Uh, blamed everyone uh, outside of themselves uh, for the COVID crisis. So they started with uh, the flights from China, saying that we have to close the airports because the, a lot of uh, Chinese are coming. Then they blamed the feminist movement because uh, a week before the, the state of, of alarm uh, was um, initiated, we had the 8th of March uh, protest. So when the pandemic went on, uh, they basically said that the, the, the pandemic was because the feminists were on the streets. And now they are uh, blaming the poor working class because in Madrid, the, the second wave is uh, going on, especially in the South neighborhoods that are the ones with uh, uh, poorer conditions, poorer living conditions. And they are actually uh, lockdowning uh, only a few neighborhoods. So uh, it is a very crash related uh, policy, but we, we are seeing it, we're seeing it in Madrid and the neighborhoods are protesting a lot against it because from an epidemiological point of view, it makes no sense because the people from the South actually work in the center or in the North, so they move. So doing a, a, you know, a class or economic related uh, lockdown uh, is a mistake. 
but yeah 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 it is uh, really related with the with this scapegoating strategy uh, thanks ornella uh, jorge uh, ornella yeah um i think that I had the impression that the scapegoating on migrants was a bit silenced during these months. Um, although we are one of the most involved uh, uh, in the um, in welcoming uh, migrants from the Mediterranean Sea, and uh, the role of Europe in this has been dreadful through the years. So we still have problems, and the government has problems in following what the agreements with Europe are about the ships that um, that save the migrants at sea. So uh, we have a problem with the hubs that um, welcome these people in the south of Italy, in Sicily, because they are overcrowded. And that is a problem for any, uh, any infectious disease, not COVID only. Uh, but um, the scapegoating about that since the country was blocked for a very long time uh, has diminished. The scapegoating was about people going out running during the lockdown or um, stuff that is, I mean, you want to smile about now. It's like uh, the, there has been so much pressure about uh, on the entire society um, in, in that period that um, all the news were about who wasn't staying at home for any reason instead of focusing on the fact that here the, um, um, the Confindustria, which is the uh, organization of the um, national industries in Italy, uh, pushed to not to make a red zone in some um, of the badly hit areas in Bergamo and Brescia in Lombardy. And that was a big problem in March because the scientific committee here, the national one, and the government um, uh, would push for a closure there and a lockdown uh, early on before the national uh, lockdown. And uh, the national organization of the industries were against, was against that. So um, of course, uh, there was a, a lot of problems in, you know, what was the real problem as, as usual in the news. Uh, and uh, the scapegoating was, um, uh, was a, I mean, I think it was constructed by, by the news and about bad journalism we have in this country. Uh, and I don't know how much it was felt by the population because I think we did prove um, a lot of actual solidarity in the country during the past few months. And that was actually a surprise to us as well. Um, and of course, uh, there is a problem in inequalities in this um, in the treatment of people because not all people have secure jobs and there is a lot of uh, people that lost their jobs or didn't access the um, the the subsidies so um, in that uh, of course um, I mean I'm reversing the the question because I, I saw a lot of solidarity also by civil societies and NGOs also in my uh, city. But um, of course, I argue that that would be more of a, the role of the state uh, and not uh, given, I mean, left to civil society and people and citizens initiative only that could give money to people that couldn't go and do the grocery. Um, uh, but that's my point of view about Italy. Uh, thank you, Ornella. Uh, Peter? Yeah, um, I, I gather that a general theme in, in our d description of the crisis was that uh, the pandemic didn't necessarily, you know, create new conditions. They more emphasized or heightened contradictions that were already there. And specifically in Sweden, that was that holds true. Um, there's been a, a growing debate on issues of immigration since the Syrian refugee wave that uh, in, in 2015. Uh, and sadly, that has been a sort of major theme of political debate, which has been concurrent with the growth of the right wing populist side of Swedish politics. And in that sense, the pandemic was a respite from this. For, for a few months, people were talking about healthcare and schools and, you know, broader political issues. Um, 
And in that sense as well, sadly, we're now back to, to uh, debating immigration and, and crime tied to immigration, which um, weakens the, the broad left in the polls and, and gives strength once more to the, to the right-wing populist parties. Uh, we're, we're, there's, there's been an entry ban for uh, immigrants um, since 2015, basically, and Sweden is accepting uh, very few immigrants at the moment, uh, either refugees or otherwise. Um, so, but there has not been any attempt to tie uh, immigrants or any specific uh, social group to, to the pandemic as such. But I think in that sense, perhaps it's, we'll see because a lot of the effects of, of the pandemic are not yet. I mean, there's an there's a deficit in uh, in uh, healthcare in the sense of operations that have been postponed. There there will be unemployment uh, rolling out in the coming years. Sweden's uh, GDP is. Uh, I mean, our economy fared better than most, and we haven't really had a lockdown, but still the GDP is down around nine percent. So in the coming five years, perhaps with the anti-immigrant sentiments. There's still time, sadly, for the for the racist right to blame the immigrants, but so far that hasn't been the case. Um, if anything, there hasn't been a return to sort of broader political issues regarding the state of, of welfare and so forth. Uh, thanks, thanks, Peter. Um, just to follow up on that, and this also is for for everybody. Um, and uh, Peter talked about the the impact of the economic crisis. Um, here in the United States, uh, GDP fell very, very sharply in, in May and June and July. It's, it's stabilized somewhat, uh, but unemployment remains eight or nine percent, and that's that's probably more like ten or twelve percent in terms of real numbers. People dropping out of the workforce, etc. Obviously, that is disproportionately impacts the young black immigrants, uh, women, etc. So there's there's a continuing economic crisis for the working class. We also have a problem in the United States in that the first bailouts, the first COVID uh, economic stimulus packages were skewed very, very heavily towards the banks and towards big business and bailing them out. So there was unemployment insurance uh, that went from May until July, it's run out. So there hasn't been any more extra or additional unemployment insurance since in the end of July. So that social crisis is beginning to hit the working class. But in terms of the, the, the bourgeoisie, the stock market is at near record highs. Um, the banks uh, are still making profits and the big corporations, especially tech, is making out uh, very, very well. So we haven't yet had major bankruptcies in the corporate world. But as Petr just said, it seems impossible that this economic crisis won't continue to hit the, 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 not only the working class, but also hit sections of the, of the, of the, uh, of the bosses. Uh, and so that raises a question of in these initial, the European Reconstruction Fund, how much of that went to stabilizing the banks, to essentially stabilizing the debt markets, and how much of that is going to filter down to ordinary people and to healthcare institutions? So, for instance, um, uh, Ornella mentioned in her opening remarks that it's, and I think Lara spoke to this as well, it's not enough just to put more money into the NHS or into healthcare in general, but there has to be a reconception of that, where the investment goes, of community healthcare, of, of addressing the crisis in elderly care. So is there gonna be money for the investments that everybody agrees are necessary in terms of the restructuring of the healthcare system to prevent this from happening in the future? Or as so much of the bailout money, so much of the reconstruction fund gone to stabilize the banks and to the debt markets and to the big corporations, that there effectively isn't any money left over. So do you feel like in your countries, there is investment, whatever the nature of the governments are? Is there real investment that's going into uh, social spending? Or is it mostly everybody has kind of pulled together for four months, the healthcare workers uh, exhausted themselves uh, to, to stabilize the crisis. And now what we're gonna see is a new round of austerity. Um, or do you feel like there is actually going to be some investment in social spending? Um, so, Petr, I'll start with you and then go backwards through that. Yeah, uh, some of my, my other colleagues will have to respond as to the European Union uh, package, because I, I believe that not much of us, that money will actually be targeted to, towards Sweden, uh, and rightfully so, since our economy is not doing uh, as poor as some of the others. In terms of investment within the national budget in Sweden, I think it 
I mean, at the moment, it, it's exactly as you describe it. There's this paradigm of the health of the market being the thing that determines the health of general people. In that sense, you know, we have to pay off the corporations to to be able to, you know, so so they can hand over money to to working people. That's the that's the general idea. It mirrors the financial crisis of 2008 in that sense, I would say. Um, and I think the left, as uh, Onala was was referring to, I think would need sort of a debate about uh, the health effects more broadly uh, writ in the sense that there's an excess mortality now in terms of specific people actually dying from the disease, but uh, the loss of years of education, uh, unemployment and so forth are all things being equal in a capitalist economy. Those are also more mortality factors and the way that those will play out in the coming 10 to 15 years is still, you know, up for debate. Um, and I think as some of you, uh, the other people uh, were discussing, the, the financing of the welfare state in a broad sense is one of the major tasks of the, the left and the radical left to, to actually restructure the response. Um, it's of course the most, you know, the, the, the oldest and most tired cliches of all that every crisis is an opportunity. And this crisis also hits us at a time when there, in most of our countries, there are weak political coalitions unable to do much of anything. Uh, sadly, also on the left. Uh, but I think that if anything, that's where our efforts should be targeted in those investments, actually restructuring the welfare states towards a more comprehensive idea of what public health will mean in the future, if that makes sense. Uh, thanks, thanks, Peter. Uh, Ornella? So uh, here uh, in Italy, there has been um, a debate that sometimes I struggle to understand deeply since I'm not an economist about what would be the best tool to, um, and the best choice for a recovery plan and to get money from Europe. Uh, and the main reason is uh, that um, there has been a very strong offensive by the Democratic Party, that is one of the two that is in uh, uh, now leading the government, uh, about um, accessing the European stability mechanism. Um, and instead, others have been saying that uh, the SURE, I don't know how to call it, uh, the European Instrument for Temporary Support to Mitigate Unemployment Risk in an Emergency, uh, is a more of an appropriate uh, uh, tool to. Um, to get, because um, basically um, the, uh, this, the, the second one, the sure, um, uh, the fund is to support the income of unemployed for amounts lower than what uh, they could obtain with the uh, European stability mechanism. And there is um, a problem with the conditionality of access to the European stability mechanism, the mess we call it here, um, um, and uh, it keeps intact the rules on the assessment of the uh, solvency of um, Italy uh, after accessing these funds. So uh, there is also a problem of how much of this money could get into services, as you said, instead of uh, getting to um, big corporations and industry and not to services to people. Uh, and also how much of this money would uh, stay in, taking into account that some of, uh, of the uh, amount has to be uh, kind of given back at the end of the uh, story. So um, it's very complex and there is a lot of propaganda going on uh, <laughs> during these months in, in my country about this. Um, as Jorge mentioned, uh, I think that the sentiment here about Europe, Europe was completely absent from the picture when we were most in need. And uh, we have suffered so much, although there is a lot of propaganda about this as well, because we are the bad ones, we have big public debt, so we, uh, we kind of deserve to suffer. This is the, the propaganda of the neoliberalists. Uh, but um, actually, we know that um, austerity made our system, our national health system worse and all our public services worse. 
and uh, actually uh, that was uh, a European choice. So we are not expecting anything different, uh, to be honest, um, but the propaganda and the government as well now are forcing this idea of uh, ah, no, now uh, Europe um, kind of um, is awake and they want to help us, so we have to accept their gifts. And <laughs> but these are never gifts without having a debt afterwards. So there is always a cost in reforms, in cuts, etc. And I think we are we, we don't deserve this in this at this point after all the austerity we suffered. And after a pandemic, that is something that wasn't even caused by uh, our system uh, itself. Thank you, Ornella. Uh, Jorge? Well, I, I have to agree with my, with my colleague, Ornella, because I think the, the problem with the, with the reconstruction fund is that, is that it, it also has conditions, although maybe they are not as strong as they, they were uh, in 2009 and 2010. But there are also conditions. We have to also to, to um, contribute to the to the European budget. So uh, with with the government that we have, the the government of the Social Democrats and, and Podemos, the feeling is that the austerity is coming again because they have no intention to to change the economic model. And there is also uh, some signs. That uh, that they are not going to to change the austerity response. First of all, last week or ten days ago, there was the privatization of the only public bank in Spain, Bankia. So instead of going for a public bank, they they let uh, they they let happen this privatization. And there is also a talks about uh, freezing the salary of the officials and extending the the retirement age. So for me, this is the, the same as austerity, but uh, in, a, in a different way. Uh, also, Ornell said about propaganda. Yeah, they're selling the this redistribution fund like a, like a revolution, you know, like the revolution coming from Europe. But uh, the sign is that the, it's not, it's not going to work like that. Also, there is a problem that uh, there is a lack of transparency. So uh, we don't know what the, where the money is going. And uh, this is also a problem because uh, uh, it is clearly not going where it should be, but uh, we we don't know we don't know really. Uh, thanks, Jorge and Lara. Yeah, I think this is a really important question about um, what's going to happen next in terms of uh, the economy. It's interesting in the political context of the UK. Obviously, we've left slash leaving the European Union, but. In terms of the austerity debate, over the last five years, we've had obviously a left wing lead of the Labour Party who unfortunately did not win power, however, transform the entire debate about round austerity. And I really think what would happen if we didn't have that, because there is really a consensus in the UK that austerity didn't work, it didn't help people. Um, you know, and it wasn't, it was a political choice rather than economic necessity it was the whole mantra over the last four years. And actually having that is so, so important. And I really hope that it kind of um, halts too much of any austerity that is yet to come. Um, and I think there'll be a lot of pushback from the UK because of that. And it shows really how obviously we want to win power as a left, um, you know, mainstream political party, but how the stuff we do outside of election time and the political narrative that we build as a left party is so important as well. And it does actually make change. Um, so yeah, we'll see, we'll see what's yet to come, but the left has to be very strong about uh, who should bear the brunt of this crisis and um, really call out the hypocrisy of um, conservative and other governments who are, you know, trying to blame the public and obviously are making profit out of this and, you know, just we need to, as the left as well, just humanise this crisis as well. Obviously, we've seen people say, how can we save the economy? Um, obviously, focus on the economy as if it's something different to people's lives or like as if these the economy is separate to people's lives and you know we need to save the economy at all costs no matter who dies or whatever and just humanize the scale of the crisis and the scale of the crisis in terms of how many people have passed away and lost family members how, how many 
staff in the NHS, how many working class people, how many people of colour, especially in our country, have lost their lives disproportionately to the general population. And we need to humanise that crisis and spread that widely because that will really change the narrative when we're dealing with the economic crisis because we need people to see that the political solutions to the crisis are not just the economy. This is a this is a human crisis, this is a public health crisis and um, any solution needs to, to deal with that as well. But I'm grateful that we've had this sort of change in narrative in the UK. We'll see what happens um, in terms of austerity measures and things. We haven't really, we've got to that yet. We're still in a phase of a lot of spending in the UK um, from the Tory government, which is obviously, as we've been discussing, like not the be all and end all, and it's not left wing socialist policies. However, it is a good thing to do in a recession uh, to invest in 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 you know sectors that are struggling. Um, but we'll see in the aftermath of the crisis, and that's where the left needs to be strongest, really, um, and setting out alternatives to what we would be doing. Um, you know, who would who would be uh, bearing the brunt of this um, and contributing their wealth to us? It certainly wouldn't be working class people and people who have, you know, sustained the health system during the crisis. And, and also on top of that, how we are going to reorganise our health and social care system and, and other public services in, um, after seeing how badly they've dealt with the crisis, you know, not the people within it, but the system as a whole you know trying to make profit out of it and how that's not sustainable and the left needs to have a clear alternative rather than just criticizing what right-wing governments are doing certainly in the uk thanks lara um thanks everyone for for all the very thoughtful comments i think what we're going to do is um i'm going to do one more round and i'll just ask a very simple question and and ask you to respond to it but also uh, maybe everybody should take four or five minutes and make their final remarks uh and the question is, so I'll ask you the question and then uh, please respond to it, but also use this time for your, for your final remarks. And you have, we'll extend it a little bit. So I'll give you more like four or five minutes uh, to, to respond. And the question is, is very simple. Um, here in the United States, we have had uh, horror over the last four years with Donald Trump. And I won't go through all the details of that because I'm sure you're very well acquainted with it. But we have also had some inspiring examples of solidarity, uh, both in people responding to Trump putting children in cages on the border, obviously the Black Lives Matter mobilizations. Uh, we're having a problem. I'm going to go to a protest as soon as this is over. Um, the, uh, the, I won't go through all the details. You know all the protests that are happening. But we have seen moments of inspiration even during the pandemic. Um, Ornella spoke about people singing on the balconies and applauding the healthcare workers in the NHS. What has something that you have seen personally in the last four or five months that has given you some inspiration and some hope for the future? Uh, if you can just give us a, some sort of personal anecdote, just to, to give us some sense, uh, some view into your window of how things look for an ordinary person uh, in your countries, that'd be great. So something, despite all of the terrible things that have been happening, something that gives you some hope that you've experienced in the last four years. I hope everyone can think of at least one thing. Um, so if you could uh, give us that and then any final remarks you want to make. And uh, Lara, you're on the hot seat, so we'll go right back to you. Oh my goodness, that's a hard question. I was just saying out loud, what a, what a hard thing. I mean, I think, it, as I've mentioned, the clapping on a Thursday for like eight weeks, originally I was like, this is rubbish. Like, this is just the government trying to put something in place. Uh, you know, like there was, there was images of Boris Johnson clapping on number 10. I was just like, no, don't clap for us. But there was one time when I was working in an ITU a couple of months ago where... I think it was the last week they were doing it or something and uh it was like all the ambulances and the police cars and everything like in the center of the hospital all put their lights and their sirens on and everyone was clapping um and it was it was really difficult and I think work, people were working in the ITUs a lot longer than me it was just it it was a horrible um experience emotionally and also physically you know wearing all the PPE and stuff like that and that kind of just human moment in it all despite the you know the political narrative behind it I think was quite um emotional but yeah I think that's something that we can draw inspiration from um in 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 general um I think you know it's 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 really interesting to see what's going on in the um, in the Amer in America with this whole crisis and you know obviously have complete solidarity from the Labour Party and uh, Young Labour here in the UK towards 
you guys and all the opposition that you're putting up as as you know as socialists as left-wing movements and um it's just it makes you really step back in, in a crisis like this and just think about uh, politics in general and the fact that this is not just you know one parliament term or four years this is you know part of a longer struggle that will go on for decades especially when you look at America um where there's such big obstacles to be overcome but to see this so the socialist narrative in the form of Bernie Sanders and other people come forward shows that you know progress is really being made and progress is only made through that struggle and not through you know being nice to the people who are in charge of us basically um and starting to define that narrative as like working people. Um, and yeah, just in general, the, the political and solidarity and the solidarity between um, people has been amazing. And I think we have a lot to learn from other countries and it's been, this has been really, really interesting, cool because you hear a lot about what's going on in other countries and how we compare to Sweden and how we compare to the US, but actually speaking to left wing activists in those countries is really important to say, now nah, this is actually what's happening. And this is the political context from a socialist, you know, perspective, which you don't see in the mainstream media is really important because, you know, it's such a unique scenario that we're all facing the similar context in with different governments. And we can actually see what's working um, in a, in a through a political lens, basically. Um, so, yeah. Thanks for, for having me on and um, I look forward to staying in contact with you all. Thank you very much, Lara. Um, uh, well said. Uh, next we go to uh, Jorge. All right, I agree it's a, it's a hard question. I would not uh, speak about a personal issue rather than a, I don't know, social movement issue because recently in, in Catalonia, uh, the, we have uh, regulated by law the prices of the rents, so it has been a, a small victory of the of the housing and living places movement in Spain, but it will for sure help a lot of people because the the housing rental prices in Barcelona and in Madrid have been a, a very a very bad situation and people were uh, being kicked out of of their houses because they were uh, the whole flat was uh, bought by a bank and the prices doubled, so the families had to get out. Now with this uh, freezing in the prices and this regulation, uh, a lot of families will be able to stay at their homes and will also be able to, to put the prices down a little bit. As I said, this is not a huge victory, but it's uh, uh, something that, that's positive uh, uh, recently, which we don't have a lot of that. And I'm gonna conclude with uh, some things that, uh, that I found uh, that we have to do in order to respond to this crisis, in order to make a, a better country and a better, uh, I don't know, better continent and a better world, I think we, we have to adapt our health, our healthcare systems, uh, not only, as uh, Ornella said before, not only to, to build more intensive care units or to build more hospitals or anything like that, but we have to strengthen our primary care or public health services and also the, the research and the scientists, because these are the things that uh, can prevent disease and that's where we have to work from now on. But not looking at uh, only the healthcare system, we have another pandemic going on, that is the pandemic of inequality. And uh, if we want to, to really change society, not only pass the crisis, but also what comes after, we have to change. We have to change the economic system. We have to change the economic model in order to to fight these inequalities and to leave no one behind. Also, if we want really to change the economic model, we need economic planification. And if we want, uh, for example, in Spain, uh, our economy model is really based on tourism, uh, automotive, and uh, construction. So, if we want to change that, we have to. Uh, makes actually a plan on economy and to nationalize companies and to really uh, fight for an eco-socialist way out of this crisis because uh, we didn't talk about it but uh, if anything we do we don't uh, take climate change into account will be will be for nothing you know and the last thing i want to say is that uh, the redistribution fund is uh, very good and we have to i don't know fight for uh, getting uh, money from europe but we have also to to redistribute the wealth within our countries and to reform the taxation system 
in order uh, for the rich to pay more because uh, in the 2008 uh, crisis uh, a lot of uh, people got richer and richer and uh, a lot of people uh, died and got uh, very bad and very poverty situations so i think uh, if we want to uh, make a change in this crisis we have to touch the risk touch uh, the rich companies and also uh, within europe we have to end up the the um, uh, taxation events so i think that's uh, the solutions i wanted to give and uh, i also thank uh, thank a lot the dsa for this opportunity and it has been a, a very good debate Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Jorge. Uh, on to Ornella. So, um, <clears throat> on the personal point of view, um, so I've been a physician, and I think that I felt very guilty at the beginning of this crisis with all my friends working in hospital without personal protective equipment and um, being exposed and being the first line, being almost sacrificed to this pandemic um, and also with, um, I mean, understaffed, of course, uh, through the years uh, and all the government and also local government because the health here in Italy is regionalized, which has been, I didn't mention this because it's too complex uh, to, to touch upon, but this has been one of the major problems of the management of the crisis because we have an, a centralized system uh, and all the regions have to send data uh, to towards the center, and it's all uh, um, it's not comprehensive the data management we have. So it's it's a lot of trouble. But uh, all the offers for jobs to uh, fill the, the the places that were understaffed and the hospitals and the primary care services and also the epidemiology services for. Uh, contact tracing and uh, keeping the count of all the cases uh, were temporary job offers for six months or one year maximum. So I felt really um, not only bad, but I feel the I, I felt the suffering as a citizen, an activist, and a doctor as well for the fact that um, all the solution. Uh, from from the government was to replace this post for uh, with with six months posts uh, for people to sacrifice their their health probably because they could get infected and they could infect their family and their uh, elderly relatives uh, and you know instead of thinking long term which we were all uh, wishing. Uh, also about the decentralization of health, which is something very much needed in this country. Um, all, all the thinking was, again, emergency thinking. So let's put some more doctors, some more nurses, some more, some more contact tracing people in the epidemiology department, but there isn't any long-term plan because that would need what Jorge mentioned. So a rethinking of the general basis of how we work as a nation and as a continent in the EU. And the economic basis aren't changed at all. And there was a saying uh, here in, in Italy, andrà tutto bene, everything will, will be okay. And it sounded like uh, a bit of a joke <laughs> after a bit because we had so many losses so many deaths, so many people with long-term problems. And, um, and, but I have to say that something good, although, although that was also propaganda, is that when we received uh, all the donations from China and not from U the EU, um, that, well, that moved people a bit <laughs> because we were actually in, uh, in dire straits and uh, someone else was coming with a lot of equipment and a lot of stuff to give, just to give, also for propaganda as well, because that is how, how it works, but uh, they did good. And also the solidarity among people, the people that just donated and donated grocery and you, it, it was called the suspended grocery, so you, you could give a bit more or a, bit, um, a couple of bags more of stuff to people in need 
and some civil society organization and also young people were involved and students, people that had more time in their hands instead of doing uh, smart working or working from, from afar. That is more correct in most cases like mine. I mean, I was just working at the computer from home. It wasn't really smart working. Um, that was something also moving because uh, we've been losing gradually this sense of solidarity in our society. And that is something that we should uh, get back. Um, in the final remarks, I think that a reform here in Italy, but in general, in general, also in Europe, a reform of the NHS is needed. And also this hospital centered um, model of care has to be rethinked. Uh, the primary health care has to be um, at the center of the care and all the preparedness uh, thinking and uh, um, funding, et cetera, has to be there. That, is, that goes with uh, health, um, health funding uh, has to be there and it's not for profit. So we have to fund services and also we, I mean, we haven't so much uh, in Italy, this uh, private-public uh, partnership like in the UK, but uh, we have outsourced a lot of uh, public services. So that has to go back to uh, public um, management. And um, so also republicize. But also at an international level, I think we have to rethink, I mean, all the role of the WHO that has been harshly criticized um, comes also with a lack of solidarity within states because we have to think, and I'll just touch very briefly upon this, about the role of WHO and the underfunding of WHO and about countries that are freezing their um, funding. And it's not, not only Trump uh, recently uh, talking about that and about uh, cutting his uh, ties with WHO, but the US has been freezing their own, uh, contributions for a very, very long, um, very long time. So that's it. My time is up. Thank you very much for having me. And I hope to keep in touch um, about these uh, topics because they're really of high interest for me. Thank you very much, Ornella. Um, my wife is an artist and she painted a very beautiful, uh, I, I'm, I'm gonna mispronounce it, but uh, Andrato Bene uh, flag on the front of our house when the crisis started. And we took that from what we saw in Italy. So thank you for that. Uh, last but not least, uh, Petr. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to be brief since a lot of the important points have been made. Um, in terms of positive developments, I think that one hopeful aspect of the Swedish experience is that, as I said, most of the actual transformations of society have not come through legislation or repressive measures, but instead through sort of collective action, almost voluntarily. And therefore, I think there's, there's hope in that, in the fact that people can, for the, for the sort of collective good, um, make... Uh, in, I mean, large efforts in, in transforming their everyday life. And that is a political potential that could be used for building a society where, where the benefit of all is, is uh, a driving uh, um, goal. Uh, in terms of sort of general political, political remarks, I think, as, as, as has been said uh, previously, um, there is nothing specifically new about the pandemic. We already knew that the neoliberal state was uh, unable to handle economic crisis, ecological crisis, and now we can add health crisis to it. It's not, I mean, it's, it's the same story, uh, sadly. And I think there's somewhat of a potential in that it, it has exposed uh, the problems of, of neoliberal healthcare and new public management, the underfunding of the welfare state and so forth. But I think the major, takeaway and the potential for the left is the fact uh, or the way that the state for a few months came sort of roaring back in, in, the, in the sense of the potential of the political. I mean imagine a year ago when Fridays for Future and, and Greta Thunberg were starting their demonstrations and telling the, the airplanes to be grounded and everyone said it's impossible it, it might be done in 10 years and then you know in a few weeks it was actually made possible again. We have, uh, we have broken budget limits in Sweden for the subsidy package which the social democrats for several years have said it's not possible because of the state of the international market. So there's a potential in that in showing what political efforts can actually be made in times of crisis. Now that being said, I mean, we can't have an economic system where, we, where there's only under 
extreme crisis that we're actually able to do sensible things. That's not a, a good way to to handle any political system. So of course it, it has to be, you know, it has to be democratically controlled and, and planned. And oh, I mean, it's not not surprising socialism is the solution to this and many more things, uh, of course. Um, but um, yeah. So that being said, it, it shows that we are we are um, intertwined and we are in, in internationally. We, there's a there's an urgent need for international solidarity in this issue as well as as many others. And there's a polit political potentiality in the fact that everyone can very manifestly see that at the moment. So we need a strong left to to be able to use that potential. Uh, thanks for having me. It's been a really interesting discussion. Thank you very much, Petter. Um, and thanks to all of our panelists uh, tonight. We've got uh, Lara and Jorge and Ornello uh, and Petter. And just a, a, the final thing to say is, uh, again, to repeat, if you're a member of DSA and you would like to get involved in the International Committee and help us sponsor events like this, please check out the newsletter from the National Political Committee that arrived in your email a couple days ago. Uh, and there's an application link on there. Um, and I want to thank all of our panelists. And just to say, in the interest of international solidarity, we have uh, what might be an extraordinary uh, election in the next five or six weeks. And we may well be calling on all of you uh, for your solidarity in defense of democracy here in the United States. So really appreciate your participation. This was not the last, but the first of many discussions. It's a pleasure to meet you all. And uh, again, thank you very much and solidarity. Goodbye, solidarity.